being outside yet? You can, you can move this. See, where you guys sit outside is dry, but where I stand outside is underwater. So I do not agree with you. You're wrong. It's just how it's going to be. I think I'm taller than Frank Elliott. I messed up my microphone. <clears throat> Shall we sing together this morning? Yeah? Let's do that. Let's stand and sing together. We haven't met inside um, in, a, in quite a while. Um, it's nice to be inside. It's nice to be in our renovated sanctuary. Um, it's nice to be in this place. And so uh, that's what we've come here for. So let's just ask the Lord to meet with us uh, here in this place today.
laugh with this one? We turn to you.
for us is amazing. We don't deserve it, yet you lavish on us freely. Lord, every breath we take is an act of your mercy, and so help us this morning to return it to you in praise and not to take it for granted, but to live our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. shipwreck along with everybody else on board and you know if I could have planned for the special effects of a tremendous windstorm to be blowing right behind us um, you know I'm really I'm not that good that was all all the Lord um, but that's where we were last week so we're going to be continuing where we left off two weeks ago so if you weren't here last week you haven't missed anything in our series through first Timothy which is good news for you but you also missed the amazing, divinely provided special effects <laughs> last week. So uh, that was awesome. As you turn to 1 Timothy 4, let me remind you of having uh, of the importance of having your Bible open. You see, a preacher could stand before a congregation and say just about anything. You could say, well, the scriptures say this or the scriptures say that. But unless you're able to follow along in the word of God, you will have no means of verifying whether or not those things are true. Also, following along in your Bible is a great way to become more familiar with your Bible. That's why I don't... Well, I'll put all the other reference texts that I'm using up on the screen. The texts that we're actually studying, I don't. Because I want you to look at it in a Bible. I want to hear pages turning. Or at least see fingers sliding on the iPhone Bible app or whatever you have. What results is this accumulative effect of faithfully reading the Word of God that's very, very powerful that we ought to not take light. So with that, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 13 through 16. Let's follow on the text together. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Remember where we are. We've been studying this letter from the Apostle Paul to the young pastor, Timothy, who's serving at the church at Ephesus, which Paul started. Timothy was trained for ministry under the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was sort of a, a spiritual father of sorts to Timothy. And he writes, well acquainted with the difficulties that Timothy would be facing in Ephesus. He's familiar with the growing movement of false teachers and Gnosticism. He's familiar with the interpersonal relationships that are causing issues within the church. He understands all of that. And so he writes to him, and what's preserved for us then is sort of a template or a blueprint of what the church ought to look like. We said that there's four pillars sticking kind of with that architectural theme. The message of the church, that was the first pillar. That's the gospel message. We don't stray from it. We don't lose sight of it. We stay focused on the gospel. We preach Christ crucified and raised for sinners. That's the first pillar. The second pillar was the membership of the church. The church is people. It's not a building, which is why it doesn't matter if we meet inside or outside or at somebody's homes. It's us together. It's godly men and godly women purposed together to glorify God and make disciples. It's a spiritually disciplined membership being led by biblically qualified pastors and elders and being ministered to by faithful deacons and deaconesses. 
its people united together for that purpose. That's the second pillar. Then the Apostle Paul shifts to this third pillar, the, the ministers of the church. Who are they? What do they do? And that's where we are this morning kind of continuing. We talked about the attributes of a good pastor and how that would contrast with one who's not so good. A pastor talks the talk. His teaching matches up with the word of God. He walks the walk. His living is consistent with his teaching. He sets a good example. We're, we're sort of continuing in that, but, but we're also going to look at our ministry focus. A man wants said to his pastor, I wish I had your job, you only have to work for one hour every week. The pastor responded, well, if that's the case, you should be an Olympic sprinter because they only work for 10 seconds every four years. And then I said, amen. In our passage, we see, we've already read it, there's a lot more to ministry than an hour on Sunday morning. We learn about how men who are called to serve as spiritual leaders of the church are to be growing and progressing in the Lord. Now, this isn't only Timothy. It would be the elders of the church. That we, and, and as we studied back in chapter 3, it's the membership of the church because really this, this example is being set and examples are to be what? Followed. Now, in our culture, the word ministry can mean a lot of things. And really, it, it can. People minister in many, many ways. Perhaps it's helping people with projects around the church or around their home. Perhaps it's leading a Bible study. Perhaps it's planning a women's retreat at your home. Perhaps it's praying for the sick or hurting. Perhaps it's any number of things. But what should the pastor's primary ministry focus on? What keeps the church from being like any other community service organization or event planning organization? It's the right ministry focus. Verse 13, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. This is our ministry focus. People need to hear and apply the word of God. Everything else that we do is aimed at that. So if we're feeding people, if we're helping people, if we're ministering to people, if we're being hospitable to welcome them, it's so that they can hear, understand, and apply the word of God. After all, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Paul says, give attention. This is a really interesting Greek word. It's prosecho. It's a present tense imperative verb. In case you want to watch me geek out on Greek for a second. <laughs> what that means is it's not something that can be taken lightly. It's not something that's passive. It's something that is always uh, deliberately pursued. It's not something that's done as a matter of convenience. It's, it's not something that we do when we feel like it. The public ministry that, that we, we do as a church, this proclaiming, teaching, applying the word of God, is serious. We're not, we don't take ourselves seriously, but we take the Lord and his word seriously. You see the difference in that? Specifically, reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Now, reading. This is the public reading of scripture in the local assembly. This is something that's modeled in Antioch of Pisidia, Acts chapter 13, uh, 13 through 15. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos... They came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. And after reading of the Law and the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue said to them, saying, Men and brethren, if any of you have a word of exhortation for the people, say on. So notice what we start with. They go, the word is read. The word of God is read. And then it's like, okay, who's going to exhort us? Who's going to tell us what we actually need to do with what we've just heard? And we see this is also modeled in Jesus. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. I'm going to come back to that slide. Maybe I don't have this in the PowerPoint. That's okay. Verse, uh, Luke 4, 16. He, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom, 
He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. How valued is the Bible in the life of the church? How, I guess I should say, how valuable should it be? How oftentimes is the Word of God, I think, I think oftentimes the Word of God is valued in the congregation as much as it is in the life of the pastor. But never more, typically. It's typically how it goes. And honestly, this is a convicting passage for me. You see, we can do a lot of things in our order of service. We get together, we pray, we do announcements, we sing some songs, we give. But unless the word of God is read aloud, unless people are exhorted to apply it and are challenged by it, unless sound doctrine is instilled and taught, we miss the mark as a church and we miss the mark as those who minister. The public ministry should include this all-in commitment to the reading of the word of God and to exhortation. Now, this word is... Paraclesis. I'll see if I can. There we go. Oh, it's going to work. I'm doing too many tasks at once right now. <laughs> there. Well, maybe it'll, maybe it'll go. We're going to leave that there for now. This is a, a, a call to action. It's a persuasive discourse. That's the word exhortation. I'm, I'm calling you to do something. So we hear the word, and then we're called to do something with it. Isn't that what we see all throughout Scripture in James, right? Don't just be hearers of the word. If you do that, you're deceived. You deceive yourself. Be doers. Actually do what it says. This word, exhortation, translated as paraclesis, is a call to action. It's the call of the man of God to the people of God to apply the word of God. There was a, there's a, in British Parliament, the second highest officer in, in British Parliament um, is called the Lord Chancellor. And the Lord Chancellor has to wear all this fancy regalia and sort of a, a lot of pomp and circumstance. One day, there was a member of British Parliament named Neil Martin, and he was personal friends with the Lord Chancellor. But he was just giving some, his friends some uh, tour uh, of, a, of a parliament building. And that day, the Lord Chancellor happened to be there in full regalia. Now, the Lord Chancellor is walking by, and he, he looks at his friend, Neil Martin. He goes, hey, Neil! And all of a sudden, this group of people that was with him bow down. They kneel. <laughs> it's a true story. This should be our response to the Word of God. When the Word of God is proclaimed, when we're exhorted to apply it, do we have that readiness to do what God says? There's really only one question that we should ask in that moment, and it's not how entertaining was the message. It's not how compelling was the message. It's not how relatable was the message. The only question should be is what was exhorted upon us consistent with the Word of God? Is what we were told to do from the Word true to the Word? And if it is, well, let me back up. If it isn't, throw it out because it's not worth anything. But if it is, then we should answer that call to action as though it were the audible voice of God from heaven telling us what to do. Now, not, I'm not saying that you should blindly follow the word of any man. That's why I started with, let's have our Bible open. Let's verify what it says. You, should, you shouldn't just take anyone's word for it, certainly not mine. But what, if what is preached is true to the text of the Bible, then you and I are accountable to instant and radical obedience. Because there is no higher form of worship. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
The public ministry is an all-in commitment to reading the word, to the application of the word, and to doctrine. I'm going to teach you one more Greek word here. Didascalia. Can you guys say that? It's fun to say. Didascalia. Now, later on, you can go and impress your friends later. And just say like, oh, yeah, did that, that ask Aaliyah? And they're going to be like, what? Oh, I didn't know I was better than you. <laughs> I know, you know. So sad. Well, let me, let's get some didascalia, and I'll teach you what it means, because that's what it means. It's the doctrine to be taught. It's what is to be taught. It's curriculum, if you will. This is the instruction. This is where the word, what, what's translated as the word doctrine in our English Bible. It's consistent with the words of Christ and the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Amen. So we could make our public ministry about a lot of things, right? But if the church and its leadership aren't fully dedicated to proclaiming the word, exhorting the congregation to obey the word, and teaching the didascalia, the sound doctrine, the truth that is consistent, the, 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 the whole of Scripture, we're failing. We're not doing what God's called us to do. But if we, if we get this right, there's some tremendous, tremendous blessings. Now, we know that not everybody's called to preach, right? Some are called to show hospitality to those who come to hear God's word. Some are called to help or provide administration or leadership. Others are called to, to teaching or discernment. People serve in all sorts of different ways. But they all have one focus, reading, exhortation, and the sound doctrine of God's word so that God is glorified and disciples are made. This is something that we all take part in, each one serving in the area of their own gifting. Let me, let me tell you this, because some of you perhaps don't know. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has supernaturally gifted you to serve in his kingdom. You are equipped to do exactly what God is calling you to do. And if you're not equipped for it, you're not called to it. That's just how it works. So when you look at the circumstances, you're like, man, I don't know how we get this done. I don't know how. I don't know. I feel God called me to this. I just, it's going to be impossible. I'm not going to be able to figure it out. Lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's false. He will equip you for everything he calls you to. And he already has. So we understand our ministry gifting. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. This is verses 14 and 15. Which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourselves entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Again, when a person accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior, that person is sealed by the Holy Spirit and given gifts for serving the Lord and ministering to other people. Timothy's particular giftedness is only mentioned here. We aren't sure what that gifting is. But evidently, Paul and the elders that commissioned him for the task of pastoring the church of, of Ephesus did know. And they prayed for him, and they sent him out, and they laid hands on him in symbolic recognition of the Holy Spirit's work in Timothy's life. Warren Wiersbe said this, So much has been written in recent years about the spiritual gifts that we've almost forgotten about the graces of the Spirit. First, let's look for these things. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You want evidence of God's working in your life? Those are the fruits that you should be examining. Are those things growing realities in your life? Are those things growing realities in the lives of other people? This, this is evidence of God's work. But this isn't unique to Timothy. This isn't for a special class of Christians. The foot of the cross is level ground. This is for all of us. 
But there are some unique ways that each one of us is gifted. And my gifting will be different than yours, and your gifting will be different than mine. But every one of our gifting is equally important and necessary, not only in the life of the church, but in the kingdom of God. So let's do sort of a quick sprint on the gifts of the Holy Spirit then. Romans 8 and 9 makes it really clear that every Christian has the gift of the Holy Spirit. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So, by implication then, if you're a Christian, you are his and have the Holy Spirit. Pretty clear, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 4-7 four, four makes it clear that every Christian has at least one ministerial gift of the Holy Spirit to be used in serving the Lord. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works in all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 through 14, we see that it's also clear that these gifts are given at the moment of our conversion, not at some later date or through some man-centered process of impartation. In him, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of to the praise of his glory. And so when we come to faith in Christ, who died on the cross for our sin, we are born again. Then, there, in that moment, we're sealed and indwelled by the Holy Spirit, who is all God. He's, that's God. The Lord takes residence in our soul, in our lives. He's indwelling us. Isn't that awesome? Just if you pause there for a second and go, wait, God's Spirit dwells within me? Yeah, because of who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. Like me, like the, 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 the wretched sinner that I am, God's spirit dwells in me, this broken and flawed vessel. Yes, absolutely, says the Bible. But, but I'm really messed up. Yeah, but he fixes you. But I'm really dirty. Yeah, but he washes you. Yeah, but I've got all these issues. Yeah, but he paid for them. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Timothy is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. He's also gifted uniquely for serving in the way that the Lord's calling. But he's encouraged to develop that spiritual gifting rather than neglecting it. He's to become more aware of it. He's to become more adept at functioning according to it. This is also true for every one of us as believers. This is something all of us are commanded you see, at our conversion, again, we're sealed and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, but we're also commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're not always full of the Holy Spirit. Think of it this way. Anybody ever put a pair of work gloves on? Anybody? Around here? A couple people, right? So when you put a pair of work gloves on, what's in the glove? Your hand, and what else? Some air, right? Maybe some mud, dirt, whatever. Manure, who, who knows, right? But it's not only your hand in there. There's other stuff, right? There's, there's room inside the glove. Now, what can that glove do? Protect Independently of being filled by something else, what can it do? Protect you. Protect you. It, it, it can't protect anything if there's nothing in it, right? That glove does nothing unless it's indwelled. <laughs> unless there's, there's a hand placed in the glove is what animates the glove, moves the glove, works the glove. The gl your hands, you can accomplish a lot, right? But the hands have to be, the gloves have to be filled in order to be productive. Here's what I want you to see. The more we try to do in our own strength according to our natural abilities, the more we put ourselves into this mold that we want to find our, our, our role or our, our lives in, we're trying to squeeze ourselves into a glove that doesn't fit. 
The more of our own sin and baggage or issues that we try to cram into ministry, the less room there is for the Holy Spirit to fill us, to indwell us, and to animate and work through us as we serve Him. I wasn't sure this analogy was going to connect, but I thought I'd go for it anyway. Is that making sense, what I'm getting at? We've got to get our own mess out of the way. The more we remove ourselves and our flawed thinking, our, 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 our flawed way of looking at the world, our faulty theology, our own human effort thinking that's what's going to please God or accomplish something good in His purpose, the more we get that out of the way, the more room there is for us to be full of the Holy Spirit who indwells us and works through us. See, sometimes we think or we're taught that the Holy Spirit is something that we move and manipulate and pour ourselves into or pour into ourselves. But let's not forget the Holy Spirit is fully God. Does the Holy Spirit need your permission to do anything? No, he's God. Does he work at our whims and invitations? No, quite the opposite. We don't move the Holy Spirit. We're moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So being full of the Holy Spirit in our personal, personal lives and living out the fruits of the Spirit in our ministry has a lot more to do with what we take out of the glove than what we put in. Get out of the way. Get our baggage. Get our issues. Get our stuff out of the way. Die to self. The less I make life about my wants, my will, myself, the more the Spirit of God fills me with Himself. So practically, how do we do that? How do I be full of the Holy Spirit? I really want to know. That sounds fantastic. That sounds like I need that. Because doing it in my strength, I'll tell you, is exhausting. You been there? Or you're just like, I am trying to serve you, Lord. I'm trying to obey you. I'm trying to accomplish all this good stuff that you want me to do. And I am just working my fingers to the bone. And there's no joy. And I'm exhausted. And this, this is miserable. Do you know that Christianity is not supposed to be miserable like that? So how do we do this? The good news is, as the Bible tells us, there's a really interesting parallel and I know that's kind of small print, it's actually bigger for you than it is for me, but that's okay. Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. This kind of tells us how. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Step one. Participate in the life of the church, not the building, not the organization, but the people who are united together. What to what? Read, exhort, apply the word. Oh yeah, and then when you get together, sing together and encourage each other. Exhort each other. And the Lord uses that. Why? Because we, we, we kind of have to set our stuff down when we come to that, and then we're getting our hand out of that glove a little bit. Parallel passage, though, this is really neat. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and in hymns and in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Very similar set of results, isn't it? Well, you want to be filled with the Lord? Well, let the Holy Spirit dwell in you. Well, let the Word dwell in you. But, but also let the Holy Spirit dwell in you. Oh, but let the Word dwell in you. It produces the same thing. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit is accompanied by the proclamation of the Word of God, and therefore we're filled. That's how it works. That's how we become full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit attends to the preaching of the Word of God. And that doesn't mean only here on Sunday morning. It could be you at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're weeping over the difficult circumstances and you open His Word and preach it to yourself. The Holy Spirit meets you there, fills and dwells you and works in your life. But it's also here. 
And I want as much as that as I can get, right? So I'm not just going to pick one or the other. I'm going to take every chance I get to be more full of the Holy Spirit and less full of me because I know what I'm full of. Picking up what I'm laying down. So the same results flow from being full of being filled with the Holy Spirit in the first case and being filled with the Word of God in the second, in the second case. To remain full of the Holy Spirit and thus enjoy the continuing sanctifying work will mean to be continued to be filled and nourished by the Word of God. The relationship is obvious. Timothy is commanded to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's evidenced by love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Every one of us are commanded to do the same thing. And the Holy Spirit accompanies His Word being hidden in our, in our hearts and minds. But when I focus on my way and not His Word, I make a mess. But when I'm focused on His Word and I get my will out of the way, then those areas where self-centeredness has been removed, I become Christ-centered. That's where we want to be. D.L. Moody said it this way. I believe firmly that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. But if we're full of pride and conceit and ambition in the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. We must be emptied before we can be filled. This should be a continual pattern in all of our lives. Less of me, more of Jesus. Can we say that together this morning? Less of me, more of Jesus. Now make that your prayer and live it out. So we know what our focus is. Our ministry focus, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We focus on proclaiming, exhorting, applying his word. But we also need to be growing. We have to be growing in the ministry that God's gifted us for, understanding who, how the Lord's made us, how he's called us to serve him. We've got to get our mess out of the way so that we can grow in that. But it isn't enough to just know that. This is something that's got to become part of our identity. It's got to become our identity. The Christian life is not a weekend hobby. It's a daily mindset. After all, we're called to take up our cross daily and follow him, aren't we? In verses 15 and 16, we see that ministry, serving the Lord, is a mindset. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who give you. That's our ministry mindset. Right off the bat, we see this command to grow in being filled with the Holy Spirit, followed by a prescription for how to do that. Well, apply your mind to the Word of God. Meditate on His Word. Meditate on his work in your life. This further emphasizes the way the Lord works through his word and filling us with the spirit. But notice that Paul says that Timothy's progress should be made evident. It should be obvious. Spiritual growth is something that at some point others ought to notice. He says meditate on these things. Give yourself to them. How much of your thoughts are focused on your spiritual growth? How much do you consider that? Do you consider it daily? Do you consider it weekly? Do you consider it once a year when somebody teaches on this text? How much spiritual growth is emphasized in your life? It's really interesting that so much of what the world says about spiritually, spirituality or being a spiritually mature person, a spiritually enlightened person, I hate that phrase, comes from this mind emptying. Turn off your mind, clear your mind, free your mind, they say. But here we see being full of the Holy Spirit, maturing spiritually, 
isn't to silence the mind. It isn't to go around the mind. It's to apply and use the mind that God's given us to meditate on his word and his work in our lives. Paul says to Timothy, give yourself to this entirely. Let God's word transform your thinking and decision making. Let it shape your values and the way you view the world. Make God's word the filter by which you discern truth and error. No, we'll just use the news for that. Often, we fall short of the Lord's best for us simply because we're too passive about our faith. It says, be constantly thinking about his word. We barely read it. It says, be mindful of his gifting in your life and use it in ministry. Most people go through their Christian life completely unaware of God's work in them or the ministry to which he's gifted them. Remember, this is the Apostle Paul. He wasn't always the Apostle Paul, but was he? he this was the guy that hated Christians. This was the guy that went around and persecuted the church. But he becomes this instrument in the hand of God that's used to bring countless people to faith and to start dozens of churches. My point is this. He knows a thing or two about spiritual growth. Right? This is where he started. Let's, let's stone Stephen to death. That's a great idea. But here he is writing the majority of the books that we have in the New Testament. This is a guy that knows about spiritual growth. It's the same guy who writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. But the grace of God, excuse me, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Do I have the wrong thing, man? I do. That's okay. Come back to that. You see, spiritual growth doesn't just happen. Understand, though, it is purely a gift of God. We don't grow ourselves any more than we make an apple tree grow by planting a seed. It, God makes it happen. But it's purely a gift of God that is bestowed on those who actively pursue it. You see what I'm saying? We should be actively pursuing spiritual growth. If we just wait around, if you take a seed and you leave it in a little envelope, how much growth is that going to do? A lot? A little? You're going to wake up one day, you got, you're, you know, you got a tree growing out of your, your, your silverware drawer where you put the little packet of pumpkin seeds? Pumpkins don't grow on trees. What are you talking about? Vines. Is that going to happen? No. What do you have to do? you got to get out and dig. You gotta till the ground, you gotta get the rocks out of the way. You gotta get the weeds out of the way. You have to apply yourself and pursue that growth. Can you make that seed grow? No. God makes it grow. It's the same with spiritual growth. We actively pursue it. We plow the stony ground of our heart. We water it, we nourish it with God's word. God causes growth. Then there's this odd phrase at the end of our passage. Continue in them, for in so doing, you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. Let me just make something very clear right now. The only Savior there is, is Jesus Christ. I'm not the Savior of anyone. Timothy is not the Savior of anyone. I'm trusting in Christ alone for salvation, just like anybody else who ever has been saved or ever will. But here's the deal. Timothy is told to pay attention to how God's working in his life and to give himself to that spiritual growth, to focus on the Word of God. By that, he would see spiritual growth. Now, what we see in 1 John chapter 5 is really interesting. Our assurance, knowing that we're saved, that, that is accomplished by the inward working of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, yes, you can know that you're saved. The Bible says so. You can, you can know. So maybe this is a side note. You walked in this morning, boy, I really hope I'm a Christian. I really hope I'm saved. I, I really don't want to die and not go to heaven. That'd be awful. You don't have to wonder that. The Bible says you can know. 
but it's the inward working of the Holy Spirit by which you know. 1 John 5, 6 and 7, and then also verse, 10, verse 13. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So it isn't that we secure salvation for ourselves by doing these things, but we become assured of the salvation he's already given us. Does that make sense? This, this weird phrase, by so doing, you save yourselves and others. No, it's, it's not that we, we purchase that salvation or we earn it for ourselves in that process. It's that we become assured of it by the inward working of the Holy Spirit as we grow. Okay, that's ourselves. But what about the other people? I'm going to save them all, right? Wrong. Jesus is still the Savior, not us. We could be the most spiritually mature people in the world and never save anybody. Why? Can't die for their sin. Got our own. But, remember what the spiritual gifts are for. They're for the edification, they're for the profit of all. So perhaps it's by the Lord maturing and working in you, even through difficult circumstances, as you come to understand and apply and walk in the ways that He's gifted you, that your friends, neighbors, family members, co-workers, people in your community, people at church, strangers at Walmart, perhaps it's through you and God's work in producing growth and fruit that other people come to know Jesus. That's how that works. The growth that he produces in us is for the benefit and the edification of other people. So, it's others who hear, others who see, others who we minister to in the ways that God has gifted us may very well be saved as God works through us. Now, I find it really interesting the way he phrases that. By doing this, you will save yourselves and others. People go through life wondering if they're saved all the time. And they just can never get to that. You will gain assurance if you're nourished by the word of God, getting your mess out of the way, allowing the Lord to prune you, focusing on his word, meditating on it day and night, you will gain assurance. And God will use you to minister to other people. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to wonder if the results will be true. He says they will. And he doesn't lie. Let's go to a couple points of application. We're going to wrap up. And go home and have some hot cocoa and watch it rain out your window. <laughs> in your life, in your home, in your thinking, in all things, emphasize the Word of God. Let God's Word permeate and wash over and filter out lies. In the ways that you interact with your neighbors and friends and children... Point them to truth, exhort them, teach them, and live out the sound doctrine that you're instructed in. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean quoting chapter and verse at every casual conversation. One, you may not be able to. Two, it may not be well received. But you can still point out the truth that God's revealed to you, the truth that he's shown you in his word, just in simply how you communicate and what you choose to believe and what you choose to focus on and what you choose to, to defer and not participate in. The content of your words, the content of your lives, the content of your character, these should be things that emphasize God's word. Second point of application, know your gifting. How, know how God made you. Know how he's gifted you for service. It's probably something that you're already passionate about. But it's also probably something that doesn't come to you naturally. 
Otherwise, it wouldn't be called a spiritual gift. It would be called a natural one. Develop it. Know what it is. Develop it. Sharpen it. Use it for his glory. If you're not using the gift he's given you, you're squandering it. And you're depriving the church of the gifts that's been provided for all of our edification. Hear me. We need your gifting. We need yours as much as we need anybody's. Your gifting, 100% as important as mine. It's equal. We need every single one of us knowing our gifting and using it for his glory in our personal lives, in our community, in the life of the church. Third, set your mind on the things of God. Don't let your faith or the expression of your faith be something that you pick up and put down like an umbrella. It's there when you need it, but when it's not raining, you just stuff it under the seat of your car. Is that where everybody else keeps their umbrella? Who has a closet? You just stuff it in there. You don't need it. It's not raining. Why don't we treat our faith like that? I'll get it out when I need it. When I have a bad day, I get some bad news, when I'm scared, then I'll pick up my Bible. Then I'll go to church. I don't go for 12 years, but then 9-11 comes, and I'm there every week for three weeks, and then I go back to where I was before. Be intentional with this. It takes commitment. It takes discipline. Be in the Word of God every day. Be consistent in prayer. Maintain those spiritual disciplines that we talked about two weeks ago. See the difficulties, the difficulties as you face as the gospel opportunities that they are. Consider how God might be working in every situation that you find yourself in and join Him in that work. But listen, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, no amount of effort will make a difference. Because you can't grow in something you don't have. That will leave you tired and frustrated like every other flawed religious system that's ever been thought of by man. So if that's you, today, turn from your sin. Trust Jesus. You are loved by God who sent his son to die so that you can be forgiven and free of your sin and grow into who he's created you to be. He came, lived a sinless life, died sacrificially for you on a Roman cross, and three days later, Jesus Christ rose to life again. And in that, he proved that he's exactly who he claimed to be. And all who trust in the Lord are saved. The Bible says that. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So don't put that off another moment. Life is short. People die suddenly. Every one of us is living on borrowed time. I don't care if you're 8 or 88. Don't put it off today. Repent and believe the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit will indwell you. You'll be His, sealed. Then this will matter. Then you can grow because you'll have something. If you're here as a believer, keep the emphasis on the Word of God. Grow in your gifting and actively pursue that. Set your mind on the things of God and follow after Him with all that you are and all that you have. Let's close with Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for that blessed assurance that all who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. Lord, I'm mindful of my mother, knowing that she is secure in your arms right now. Lord, I thank you for the comfort of your word that gives us assurance. That we don't have to wonder, we can know. But that's only through you. It's through what you've done on the cross. It's not by our effort. God, help us to join you in your work, not for our salvation, but from it. To 
grow into who you've created us to be, to be full of your spirit so that we are effective in the world, effective in the ministry that we put our hands to. God, help us to get our, our hang-ups and our hurts and our, our issues out of the way, to set them down, these burdens that we're not meant to carry. God, help us to be people who focus our lives on making your truth known in a world that's desperately in need of it. Help us to be people who are, are growing and, and maturing so that we can faithfully endure through hardship and loss, and grief, through regulation, through all number of trials. We can do so knowing that we're secure in you. We don't have to panic because you're the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, you finished everything you started. So God, we thank you for your good work that you began in us. We trust you to complete it. Lord, fill us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I guess we're supposed to sing the doxology, right? That's what we do now. It's weird being inside. Everything's